is, it is such a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for the invitation. It is a joy to be back in Oregon and to see good friends and that I've met along the way in our 700-mile journey when I came back when I was here two years ago. So thank you so much. And how many of you have had wow moments? A wow moment, something that just left you speechless. And the only thing that can come out of your mouth is wow. Can I share my wow moment with you? Thank you. Well, one day, about, let's see, about six years ago, I sat at the doctor's office in the chair, and he was about, I, I was waiting for him to come in to give me the results of the exam. How many of you have been in that position, waiting for the results of the exam? And so I was waiting and waiting, and things were just going through my mind. It's like, I wonder, I wonder what the results will be. So as I sat there waiting and praying, <clears throat> hoping that everything would be okay, he comes in with a smile. Now, if the doctor comes in with a smile, what would that mean to you? Good news. See, but my doctor was a comedian. So I didn't trust him too well with the smile because I'm thinking, I bet you he has something not good but good or he thinks it's funny and I don't know. I just didn't trust him that well. Now, that's not good if you don't trust your doctor. But I knew him. So he comes in and he says, well, Mrs. Jaworski, I have some news for you. And I go, okay, hurry up and say it. You're going to need glasses. I'm like, what? Yes. Well, you're 40. And, and I go, what are you saying that I'm 40? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, things start to change. And I go, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, things, he didn't want to say it, but he said, well, things start to break down. <laughs> well, six years later, here I am with bifocals. <laughs> And he was right. Things started to break down a little, just a little bit. Not that much, just a little bit, you know. And, and so I get a kick out of it every time I put my glasses on because I remember exactly what he said. You're going to need glasses. And as you get older, you're going to need them more and more. I'm like, okay. That was my wow moment, but it wasn't a positive wow moment because then after that, I realized that a lot of things just started going awry in my life. How many of you had that fuzzy thinking? You know, you just can't remember. All these things are, and even my hearing, I think it's going. Well, I maybe selective hearing, <laughs> but even my hearing. So how many of you are familiar with Dr. Seuss? Well, I created my own Dr. Seuss poem. Can I share it with you? Okay. <clears throat> I can't see far. I can't see near. I can't think clear. And can't even hear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Do you like my Dr. Seuss poem? I was thinking of publishing it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and a couple more phrases. Okay. I'll work on that. I have a long flight tomorrow. I think I'm going to work on that. <laughs> I also like this poem. It's not my poem. I read this somewhere. But it kind of fits the, the theme that I'm talking about. <clears throat> My face in the mirror isn't wrinkled or drawn. My furniture is dusted. The cobwebs are gone. My garden is lovely. So is my lawn. Don't think I'll ever put my glasses back on. <laughs> I have a feeling most of us can relate to this, right? Our changes, you know, in, within us. But I love what 2 Corinthians 4.16, if you have your Bible, please don't open it up. If you have an app, look it up. 2 Corinthians 4.16, I'm going to share lots of Bible verses. And what I encourage you to do is just jot them down. Because perhaps, maybe along the journey, you're going to find someone who, you know, is going to need some words of encouragement, maybe on this topic that we're going to cover. And you're going to say, you know what? I have some Bible verses I can share with you, and you're going to be ready to, okay? So just a couple things that we're going to review this afternoon. 2 Corinthians 4.16, 
Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Who praises God? Amen. And I told the ladies in my first seminar, you know, the angels praise God constantly, 24-7. Can we praise God constantly? Don't be afraid to just shout amen. Praise the Lord, whatever's in your heart. Now, I was born in the island of Puerto Rico, and many of you realize there's a lot of devastation going on there, so please continue to keep them all in prayer. And my family are, I still have family there. But being Puerto Rican and coming from New York, I'm a little lively. <laughs> so I encourage a lot of you to just smile and be, um, you know, like don't be afraid to say amen and praise the Lord. Is that okay? Yeah. Amen. Amen. That even though we are inwardly, outwardly, um, wasting away, as the Bible says, but in, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. His mercies are new every morning. Who praises God for that? Amen. Amen. Well, although my physical eyesight is wasting away as well, but aren't we blessed? And shouldn't we praise the Lord that God's eyesight is perfect? Have you ever told your kids, I'm watching you? <laughs> keeping my eyes on you. Maybe not that mean. <laughs> Maybe you're nicer. <laughs> no? <laughs> she says no. <laughs> oh, you're all, oh, so that's a constant that you're doing. <laughs> it's a daily message. <laughs> but God is constantly watching you. How does that make you feel? Huh? <laughs> How does it make you feel? Protected, loved, awesome. Those are good words. Let's turn to Genesis 16, 13. Genesis 16, 13. And God's word reads, She, talking about Hagar, gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. What is going on in this Bible verse? What happened to Hagar? She got kicked out. That's the best way to say it. She got kicked out. Why? Because Abraham was promised to be the father of many nations. And Sarah, his wife, waited and waited and waited. So she finally took matters into her own hands. And when that happens, everything turns out well, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. So she gave Abraham her servant, Hagar, and she had what? A baby boy. And Sarah was so happy. <laughs> was she excited? At first, she said, our sister's saying at first, but it got to the point she began to treat her with jealousy and hatred. And Hagar, what did she do? She ran away. But even in the midst of a dry and wasted land, who was there watching her? God. God was there. El Roy. El Roy is the God who sees. That is the Hebrew name. The God who sees. When I say, anytime you hear me during the presentation say, El Roy, I want you to say, he sees me. Is that okay? It's a little test to see if you're listening. El Roy. Okay, anytime during the presentation, I may forget that you need to say it, but you're going to remember, right? Anytime I say El Roy. Very good. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> awesome. The God who sees me appears in the Bible. This is the first time. El Roy, he sees me, is a combination of two significant Hebrew words. El means God, all-powerful, mighty God. And Roy means to see. So when you put these words together, El Roy 
means the all-powerful God who sees everything in the universe. Is there anywhere that you can escape to that he won't see you? How many of you have played hide-and-seek as adults? <laughs> yes, as with your children or grandchildren, right? What happens when you play hide-and-seek? Someone hides and the other one goes seeking. Now, when you're hiding, I remember when I was young, as long, they, they may see parts of my legs hiding, but as long as I don't make eye contact, <laughs> they can't see me. <laughs> At least that's what I was thinking. They can't see me. Psalm 139, 7, the Bible tells me, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Is there anywhere in this world that you can go to that he will not reach out to you? There's nowhere. There's no place. Everywhere you go, he's already there. Do you say amen? Amen. Everywhere you go, he is already there. El Roy. In the darkest times, he sees you. Maybe you feel alone in the crowd. He sees you. Maybe you're walking by yourself and you're thinking, oh, I'm all alone. But he sees you and he's with you. Does that bring you comfort? No? Amen. Yes. We're going to look at four instances. Now, this is just four times in the Bible that, I mean, there's so many. But I just want to cover four of where God sees a certain person and what he does about it. So let's look at Mark 12, 41 through 44. Mark 12, 41 through 44. <clears throat> this is a story where Jesus is in the temple. And if you have your Bibles, it says that he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing. And here are all, you know, all the people coming in, putting from their money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums. Oh, could you imagine the spectacle? Look what I'm giving. But a poor widow came and put how much? Two little copper coins. I mean, they weren't worth anything. And calling to his disciples, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty. She put in all she owned that she had to live on. You see, God watches you what you're doing. Whatever you're giving in church, he's watching. But you're thinking, oh, but I don't have much to give. You know, I see other people much more talented, and they're giving so much. But even the smallest thing that you can give, he is taking knowledge of that. He sees it. The spirit of prophecy says that these two small copper coins bless the kingdom in abundance because God multiplies it. Do you believe that he multiplies your gifts and your talents? Whatever you come into church to give, he multiplies it. Come in and say, you know, whatever little, if I have to scrub the floor of the church, I'm going to do that because that's what I can do. And he takes notice of that, and he blesses you for that. I can only play the piano with only one, you know, finger, but I'm going to do it. And he blesses that. And pretty soon you'll be playing the piano like, like a concert pianist. <laughs> because that really happened. I had to, the pastor from the church where I was, it was a very small church in, in upstate New York where I grew up. And I was, the pastor's wife was the pianist of the church and they left. And they, I was the only young person in the church and they were looking for a pianist. So who did, who's all eyes turned on to? Me, and I was only like 10 years old. That's just a lot of pressure. <laughs> so there I am, and they said, well, you need to start taking piano lessons. 
And everybody was singing hymns, and there I am playing note by note the piano <laughs> as they were all following along. And then pretty soon I added two notes. <laughs> and then pretty soon I'm like, <laughs> but thank God that I was willing to give whatever little I can give. And God multiplies it because he sees you. He sees the motivation of your heart. So don't be afraid to go up to someone and says, I have this little bit to give, but this is all I have. And I want to give it to God and he will multiply it. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Another story, Matthew 8, 14 through 15. Matthew 8, 14 through 15. Now Jesus had come into Peter's house, and what did he do? He saw his wife's mother lying sick with fever. He took notice. When we invite Jesus into our homes, he takes notice of what's going on. Does he not? Amen. He saw his wife's mother lying sick, and he touched her hand. And the fever left her. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, he sees you when you are in need of healing. How many of us are in need of healing? All of us. Spiritual, mental, emotional. Let me tell you, I have to have people praying for me in my mind. I'm starting to forget things. I mean, it's getting serious. But I need, I need mental healing, things that have happened in the past, the hurt, the scars. I need emotional healing, mental healing, physical healing. And God sees it all. And he wants to touch my life with his healing. And he wants to touch your life with his healing. Are you willing to let him in, in your heart, so he can heal you completely? All you need is his touch, and he will heal you. Amen? Because he sees you. He is El Roy. Amen. Another story, Mark 5, 25 through 34. Another story where Jesus takes notice. This one talks about, Mark 5, 25 through 34. He, this one talks about the woman with the flow of blood. We're familiar with that story, are we not? She suffered how many years with a, with a condition, medical condition? How many? Twelve years suffering financially because she gave what? All her money to find a cure. Now, because of her condition, she was considered what? unclean so chances are she if she had a husband before she couldn't have one she people couldn't touch her people can hug her could you admit how many of you love to hug am i the only one i'm a hugger hugs are so important i read somewhere psychologist psychologist says that we need at least 15 hugs a day for mental health oh somebody's saying well that that explains a lot <laughs> You know what? Why don't you hug someone right now next to you? Just give them a hug. Maybe this is like the only hug they're going to get or something. <laughs> give them a hug. You want to you wanna squeeze in maybe three hugs? That's three already. <laughs> How wonderful. How does that make you feel when someone hugs you? Oh, you smile. And even if you're crying and somebody hugs you, that's like a reassurance. That's like, you know, everything's going to be okay. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray with you. Oh, hugging is just absolutely wonderful. I did a mental health seminar, and one of the things I covered was hugging, and all the benefits of hugging is just tremendous. And even laughter. I'm going to have to add laughter into there. How many of you love to laugh? <laughs> Let me hear you laughing. <laughs> It's contagious, isn't it? And it quickly just brings a smile to your face. And when I told the ladies, I said, did you know that in laughing it keeps you young? Everybody started cracking up. <laughs> and I said, it is. You get abs <laughs> from laughing. That's right. 
And even hugging keeps you young. And when I said that, I think they just stopped listening to me and they started hugging everybody. So all these wonderful things. But this lady here in this story, this woman, couldn't have that special touch that we so desperately crave and need. She had a condition, so she finally got to the point, you know, she heard about Jesus, and she said, I need to go to him. And she did. And she went behind him, and, went, you know, even though it was crowded, she went and she reached out. She made an effort. Sometimes we have to place that effort, don't we? We have to just kind of stretch ourselves to, to be all that God wants us to be, and that's to have a deep relationship with him. And that's what she did. She goes, I need Jesus to heal me. And she did. She stretched out her hand, and immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt her body healed of the affliction. Praise the Lord, right? Amen. She was healed. You see, but Jesus takes notice of your effort. Jesus takes notice when you reach out to him. And he turned around and asked what? Who touched me? And, of course, you know, the disciples with it. I, I can just imagine them with a little attitude. What? what uh, hello? Uh, did you see everybody around you? <laughs> what do you mean you're asking who touched you? Yeah, because it was a special touch. And Jesus takes notice. He is Elroy. Amen. That's right. He sees me. And he turned around. He took notice. And she had no choice but to tell him everything because, you know, he wants to have a relationship with you. He not only sees you, heals you, but he wants to talk with you. He wants to hear you. How many of us love to talk? That's why I became, became a public speaker. You have no choice but to listen. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> you do have a choice. But we love to talk. We love to share. We love to express. And sometimes alone in the crowd, maybe you don't have someone to share with. And you're seeking someone. Well, there is El Roy. He sees you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And you can talk to him all you want. Isn't that exciting? I have to tell my husband, oh, oh hold it. I got to talk to God. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. I got to talk to God. And that's what he wants. He wants. So he turned around and then he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And how many of us need peace? How many of us want peace? Then we need to have that relationship with God. And our fourth story is found in Luke 13, 10 through 17. Luke 13, 10 through 17. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for how many years? 18 years. Now, first, we had a woman who had the flow of blood for how much? 12 years. I mean, that's a long time. Even a couple days is a long time. Of, have you been sick for just a few days when you have that flu? And usually flu is about how many days? Three or four, depending. But even then, it seems like what? An eternity. We're talking about years. So this woman, 18 years, was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. So how was she? She was walking around how? Bent over. This is how she was walking for eight years but I praise the Lord she was still going to church amen because that's where Jesus found her that's where Jesus saw her sometimes if it's bad weather I'm like oh I'm gonna have to think about going to church <laughs> but she kept going to church in her condition and there verse 12 Jesus saw her not only does he see you, but then it says he called her to him. Isn't that beautiful? He acknowledges you by calling your name. He calls you. I may not know all your names. I know maybe a few. God knows your name. And he calls you. 
He's calling you right now because he wants to heal you. You see, she kept going to the synagogue even though she was bent over. How many of us just keep going to church even though it's a struggle? She has, you know, it's like chains on you, and you still keep going to church. But you see, one day, God met her there and delivered her from those chains. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, and then he put his, he laid his hands on her. So here he goes again, touching her, that special good touch. And immediately she was straight and glorified God. Praise God. You see, but there's someone that does, that wants to steal your joy. And who's that? Satan. Why is it that sometimes when, when, when good things happen, something happens that contradicts that good thing that just happened and kind of like deflects your eyesight from what the good happened? So here she is in the synagogue, and the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. And I can imagine, now I'm from New York. There's plenty of attitude to go around there. So I, I can just imagine the, the leader of the synagogue with a little attitude like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Okay, um, you know, there's six days that you guys can do this. Why is this happening here? Um, therefore, come and be healed on them, not on the Sabbath day, but Jesus comes to our rescue. See, he sees what you're struggling with. He sees how other people attack you. Racism, judgment, gossip. How many of you else have experienced that? Misunderstanding, rumors, here and there, little whispers that are so untrue. But Jesus comes to your rescue to defend you. Amen? And he says, hypocrite. It's a famous word, one of his famous words. Does not, towards the, the leaders of, of, of the synagogue, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all the adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Praise the Lord. See, he sees you struggling. He sees the chains that you are battling with. And he wants to straighten you up. He wants to straighten things out for you. How many of you are willing to allow Jesus to break those chains in your lives? Amen. There's a seminar that, that I, um, I enjoy talking about. These chains don't work. And I tell the ladies to just do something like this, like just pretend, you know, you have these chains and just say, these chains don't work. And you have to say like you mean it, like you believe it, that God is going to break those chains. Can we do that? Okay, ready? Okay, go like this. One, two, three. These chains don't work. Okay, I, I didn't quite feel it. <laughs> let's do it one more time. Okay, let's do it one more time. And have faith and believe that God is going to make a miracle in your life. That he will do the impossible in your life to set you free from, from those chains. Okay? One, two, three. These chains don't work. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sabbath after Sabbath. This woman came to church, so don't be afraid. And don't say, you know, I have to be extremely perfect to go to church. Don't ever say that. That's where you're going to meet your Savior. That's where you're, you're going to have an encounter, a special encounter with God. Keep going. Keep giving of yourself for his service. And he will begin that healing process you so desperately need each and every day. Now, if you like to learn more about the names of God, the Hebrew names, you can download praying, 30 Days Praying the Names of God. Um, I posted a little sheet on my website, creativebox.org, creativebox.org, and I have some business cards I can pass out afterwards. And all you have to do is download the sheet, and it's 30 Days Praying the Names of God. So each day it just chooses a, a description of who God is, 
you know, we have to be still, Psalm 4610, and know what? That I am God. And just spend some time just getting to know him for the depth and the riches of him. I mean, we really can't comprehend it all. But, you know, he gives us enough in his word for us to establish a good relationship with him. And, you know, God sees you because you are a woman of worth. A woman of worth. Can you say wow? Wow. Woman of worth. Say wow. Look at the person next to you. (laughs) That's right. Just tell them wow. You are a woman of worth. Say it to her. Our woman of worth. That's right. Thank you. You are a woman of worth. How many of you believe that? (laughs) I didn't hear a word. (laughs) That that took a while. (laughs) You know, many times when Jesus um, was about to heal, he says, do you believe I can do that? So do you believe you are a woman of worth? Just look to the cross. He came to die in your stead. Are you not worthy? Have you not been worth it? Worth it? I mean, he loves you so much. He came to give his life for you so you can believe and be saved. Have that opportunity to believe in him and be saved. You are a woman of worth. And he loves you beyond your, your wildest imagination. I mean, he's just crazy about you. Have you ever heard there's a saying that says that if, he had a ref- if God had a refrigerator, he'd have your picture on it? Have you? I read that somewhere. Or if he had a wallet, he'll have his picture on it? Well, you know what? In the palm of his hand, he has written your name. And those are the scars from the cross. Because he loves you so much. So do you believe that you are a woman of worth? We may not feel worthy because God has done so much for us. But we are women of worth. So how can we begin to to have that understanding that we are women of worth? Well, first of all, God needs to open up our eyes. Okay? Now, like I was mentioning, you know, my eyesight is kind of leaving me a little bit here. But he will open up our eyes. Jesus came. It says Luke 4, 18 through 19. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And not only physical, but spiritual. I need to see how God sees me. There's another seminar that I do. It's God's Beauty Salon. And one of the ladies, oh, she's not here. She says, I remember when you came two years ago and you did the mirror. We had to look at ourselves in the mirror. And we had to say how beautiful we were in God's sight. And we had to say some things. How many of you, when you look in your mirror, what's the first thing you see? Somebody said, wow. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) No, seriously, how many, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Where, where is your attention to? Your, your pimple here? A little poking hair? <laughs> you know, we start looking at, at all these things that we have going on. Is everything inside? Do I have, you know, um, you know any marks on my face? I mean, we, it's a natural tendency to do that. But how many of you can wake up and say, girl, you got it going on? And just kind of give yourself a wink. <laughs> and then, <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Can we honestly look in the mirror and say, I am loved. I am forgiven. I am justified. I am lifted up. I am clothed in his righteousness. I got it going on. How many of you can say that? Or you want to say that? You want to say that? You're going to start saying that from now on. How's that? 
from now on, when you look at yourself in the mirror, because you are a woman of worth, you are? Wow, that's right. That is right. And this is what Jesus did for us. But Satan wants to steal that. In John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to what? To steal, destroy, kill. He doesn't want you to look at yourself as God sees you. He wants you to look at yourself as unworthy, not worth anything. Oh, look at you. Look at all your past mistakes. You can't do nothing for him. You can't. You Don't even go to church. They're just going to criticize you. Don't do this. Don't do that. And just tries to, to steal everything that God wants to do in your life and destroy it. He wants to destroy it. And But we're not going to allow that, right? Because we are what? Wow, women of worth. And you're going to say no. I'm going to stand here from, that's right, these chains don't work. <laughs> that's right. And you're going to stand there and say no, 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 no. Get away from me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Because I am a woman of worth. And he died to save me. There was a story I read somewhere, and it's, it's a cute story. I'll read it to you. A young couple moves into a neighborhood. Okay. The next morning, while they were eating breakfast, the young woman sees her neighbor hanging up the clothes. That laundry is not very clean, she says, as she's looking at her neighbor putting up in the laundry line there. She doesn't know, she doesn't know how to wash properly, correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. So her husband looked on but remained silent. So the next day, the neighbor was hanging up the, the laundry again. And she, she again proclaimed, oh, look at how dirty that laundry is. Disgusting. Why, why is she even, what is she washing with? And the husband again kept quiet. So about a month later, the woman was surprised to see a nice clean wash on the line oh, and said to her husband, look. She has learned how to wash properly. I wonder who taught her this. And the husband said, <clears throat> I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. <laughs> we need to have new spiritual eyesight, do we not? Because the way we look other is the way we're seeing ourselves is the way we see ourselves. How can I say to my sister, you are a woman of worth when I don't believe that I am? Okay, so how can we begin to look at ourselves as women of worth? Well, I use the word worthy as an acronym. So I'm going to use each letter and I'm going to say something about how we can begin to look at ourselves as women of worth. Ready? W, if you want to write these down, it's up to you. Work, W, work on eliminating negative attitudes and beliefs. That's a big one. First of all, it starts with the word work. Right there, I'm just tired. <laughs> I already work. Now I got to work on this too? Work is not a passive word. It's what? It's an active word. That means there's going to be some things that need to be done. I need to transform my thinking. I need to focus on what is positive. It's going to take work. But you know what? To get to heaven, is it a passive way to heaven? The spirit of prophecy tells us it's a battle and a march. It is. Every day I have to put on the armor of God and go to battle. Thank God that he's my captain and he fights my battles. But there is a place, that, there's a part for me to play in this too. I have to work. You see, I have to eliminate negative attitudes and beliefs. Philippians 4.8, you can reference later, which talks about whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is no noble. If there's any, anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I have to be careful how I feed, what I'm feeding my mind. I have to be careful what I watch on, on, the, on TV, on the Internet. 
because that's playing a huge part as to how I see myself. You know, these, these um, makeup companies, they spend billions and billions of dollars on advertising to make you feel unworthy and ugly. Oh, I need to get that. I need to get that. I have to be careful where I place my thoughts. What am I thinking? Be aware of the thoughts that run through your mind. But anything that's beautiful, right, pure, lovely, those are the things that I have to focus on. Isn't Jesus lovely? I should be focusing on him and his life. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be careful where your mind is heading to, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So how can I begin to eliminate negative attitudes and belief? Well, repeat after me. I accept... Okay, everyone, it's just not for certain people. Everyone, I accept God's word that I was created in his image. I accept the fact that I will not be liked or loved by everyone. What am I talking about? Everybody loves me. I'm joking. But we have to come to that realization. You know, as a public speaker, I've traveled to many places, and I realize that my message may not reach everyone. I may not be liked by everyone. But you know what? Jesus came, and he did what he needed to do regardless. And if God has given you a purpose, he's given you a calling, you do it regardless for such a time as this because he will place you in the position you need to be even if you need to touch and reach one soul. And one soul, there's great rejoicing in heaven, is there not? Over that one repentant sinner. So regardless, regardless, you keep moving forward while looking upward, right? I accept the unchangeable circumstances in my life. There's some things that can be changed and there's other things that just can't be changed. Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> you were like, wait, slow down. That's a lot. <laughs> I accept the fact that I will make mistakes. How many of you have not made any mistakes today? Oh, wow. There's like no one. That's right. We all make these. Oh, I gotta, can I share with you one of the mistakes I made? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'll share with you one of the mistakes I made. Years and years ago, I work at a school now, but before... This job I've, I've been at for 15 years, I went for a job interview at a hospital. Well, I was going to that morning, so I, wake, I woke up, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I was like, ah, oh, okay, you know, dress, you know, trying to fit everything, everything looks fine. So I go to my husband, and I said, how do I look, honey? And he says, you look beautiful, and I go, right answer, okay. <laughs> Then I go to my kids. My girls were tiny little things. And, of course, you know, kids are the most honest people on this earth. If you want an honest opinion or you don't want to hear the truth, don't ask them. <laughs> so I asked my girls. I said, how do I look? I said, oh, Mommy, you look beautiful. I'm like, okay. So all confident and, and all put together, I'm heading towards the car. And then I parked in the parking lot, and which is, why is it that in hospitals the parking lot is so far away? Someone explained that to me. So I had to park all the way down, and I had to walk all the way across the parking lot. Then I had to enter the lobby. I mean, it's quite a distance. It was, the lobby was packed, and I'm walking. And I, by, that, by the time I got to the elevator, I'm exhausted. I'm pressing the button, and all of a sudden, I turn around, and there is this lady. Wait, wait, and she's running towards me. And so I'm like, well, it is a hospital. 
So I'm thinking, okay, something happened, you know, so I'm like holding the elevator for her and everything. And so I'm ready to let her in. I said, no, please, you know, you go in first. And she goes, no, 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 turn around. And I go, what? And she zippered me up all the way. Yeah. No, that was a wow moment. Now, I have a sense of humor. So I started laughing. I'm like, well, I think a lot of people got healed today. <laughs> As I'm walking down the lobby. <laughs> So mistake number one, you know, um, check yourself thoroughly in the mirror. <laughs> but, you know, things are going to happen, and it helps to have a little bit of sense of humor, doesn't it? It really does. So accept the fact that I will make mistakes. Repeat. I accept what I cannot change about myself. Sometimes we wish we can change things, don't we? Accept the beautiful you God has created you just accept that you are beautiful do you accept it okay all right let's let's try this again <laughs> do you accept the beautiful you God has created yeah. amen amen very good and I accept myself as acceptable to Christ. Amen. What letter am I on? I'm still on W all that time? All right, we're going to O. <laughs> o. Obtain. Again, it's an, oh, yeah, no repeat. <laughs> Don't repeat. <laughs> Obtain <laughs> a scriptural understanding of God's thoughts towards you the way he sees you. And you can read Psalm 139, and it gives a beautiful illustration of all the wonderful ways that God thinks of you. So read that on your spare time. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of what? Peace and not of evil to give you a future. Isn't that beautiful? When you can really see yourself as God sees you, for he knows those thoughts. I want you to realize five things. Realize that God knows all about you. Do you have a best friend who just says, well, I know her. I know everything about her, but does she really know everything about you? No one can really, 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 really deep down know everything about you. Except Elroy. Amen. He knows all about you. Remember that God is always with you. Amen? Amen. Respect the fact that God created you for a purpose. Do you believe that? Amen. Let me see those smile. That's right. God created you for a purpose. Four, recognize that God uniquely designed you. Look at the person next to you. Do they look like you? No. <laughs> There's no one else. You are unique. Isn't that beautiful thought? You are the only one like you. No one else is. And sometimes we have to praise God for that. <laughs> Receive God's loving thoughts toward you. Oh, he loves you, ladies. I can't stress that enough how much he loves you. He's crazy about you. He's watching over you like a shepherd towards his sheep. And he cares for you deeply. R. So W-O-R. Refuse. Another active word. Refuse to compare yourself with others. Uh-oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us that we should not be measuring ourselves with others. How difficult is that? Huge. Someone's being honest here. That's right. It is huge. Because as soon as you see someone else, what is the first thing that got, runs through your mind? What do you do with the person? You check them out. What is she wearing? How does it look on her? Look at her hair. I wish I had that color. 
Look at her dress. Oh, that's a nice. I wish I had. You know, you start com. Look at her talent. She's so talented. So we start comparing what you can do, what your lack of, with others. Is that what God wants us to do? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I'm going to read this to you, um, for you. I am special, and I love these encouraging words, and I want to share them with you. Okay? I am special. But when I say I am special, you think of yourself, too. I'm just not talking about me. You are special, too. I am special. In the world, there's nobody like me. Do you believe that? I mean, not me, not you. <laughs> you know what I mean. Okay. I am special. There's no one There's in the world, there's nobody like me. Since the beginning of time, there has never been another person like me. Nobody has my smile. Nobody has my eyes, my nose, my hair, my voice, because what? I am special. Say it. I am special. No one can be found who has my handwriting, or decipher it for that matter. <laughs> Nobody anywhere has my taste for food or music or art. No one sees things just as I do. In all of time, there's been no one who laughs like me. Let me hear your laughter again. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, that was okay. <laughs> no one who cries like me. No crying here. No crying. It says, and what makes me laugh and cry will never provo provoke identical laughter and tears from anybody else ever. Have you ever had someone who just laughs and laughs and you're like, oh, just stop the laughing. That wasn't that funny. <laughs> Have you had any, you know, a moment like that where they just find something so hysterically funny and you're just standing there saying, I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't get it. That's because they are unique. They see the world differently. No one reacts to any situation just as I would react. I am special. I'm the only one in all of creation who has my set of abilities. Oh, there will always be somebody who is better than at, at one of the things I'm good at. But no one in the universe can reach the quality of my combination of talents, ideas, abilities, and feelings. Like a room full of musical instruments, some may excel alone, but none can match the symphony sound when all are played together. I am a symphony. Repeat that. I am a symphony. Through all eternity, no one will ever look, talk, walk, think, or do like me. I'm special and I'm rare. And in all rarity, there is great value because you are a woman of worth. Wow, very good. And because of my great value, I need not imitate others. Be yourself. I will accept, yes, celebrate my differences. I am special. And I am beginning to realize it's no accident that I am special. I'm beginning to see that God made me special for a very special purpose. He must have a job for me that no one else can do as well as I. Out of all the billions of applicants, only one is qualified. Only one has the right combination of what it takes. And that one is me. Because I am special. Do you believe that? Say it together, each and every one of you. I am special. Amen. What letter are we on? T? T. Did you say L? <laughs> T. Very good. R is refuse to compare yourself with others. Yep, so now we're in T. Thank God for his unconditional love for you. Do you thank him? Every time you wake up in the morning, do you thank him? Or you're like, oh, I got to wake up. Or do you wake up? Yes, Lord, thank you. You woke me up. Here's my agenda. I have a lot to do today. I have a lot of kids to take care of, a husband, work. But thank you, Lord, because you love me and you are my El Roy. You see me. You know my needs. And you promise to supply 
all of my needs according to your riches and glory. Do you wake up that excited? Oh. <laughs> Do you want to wake up that excited? Yeah. Amen. You can open up your eyes and just as soon as you open your eyes, just thank you, Lord, because your love is still with me. I may be sleeping through the night and don't realize what's going on, but your love is still with me. I thank you. So have and choose to have an attitude of thanksgiving. Everything that goes on, there may be turmoil, but thank him anyways. He has a purpose in it all. And he's still with you and loving you. Thank him. H. H. Hope in God's promise to mold you to be like Christ. Hope in God's promise to mold you to be like Christ. Romans 8.29. You can reference that. Hope in God's promise to mold you to be like Christ. Who wants to be more Christ-like? You know, every day is a process of growth of growing. Isn't it wonderful when you when you see someone you haven't seen in a long time and they say, "My, you have changed." But well, hopefully it's a change for the better, right? But isn't it wonderful when it is a positive change? Like there's something about you that's different. You know, you you no longer have that that bad attitude. <laughs> You're smiling more. You're more positive. And you can honestly say, well, Jesus has changed my life. He has changed. He's transforming me. I want to grow. Um, about seven, seven or eight years ago, I, when I started my, my speaking ministry, I went to this church. Now, I got to tell you a little bit about myself here. I don't have a gift for gardening. I can tell you that right now. If you give me a plant... 100% chance is that it may not survive. <laughs> I mean, I will try. <laughs> I will try, but I, my record has not been good. So if you give me a plan, oh. So when I started my speaking ministry, um, the, the woman ministry director, she, guess what she gave me as a gift? A plant. The poor thing, I think as I held it, I think it withered already. It's like, well, this ain't going to be good. <laughs> this does not look good for me. But it wasn't so much the gift that, that kind of just made me realize so much in my life. It's the note that she attached to it. She said, as this plant grows, so does your ministry. And I was like, this is not good. I never Googled so much in my life how to keep a plant alive. I have to say it is still growing. <laughs> and why, finally, from the word worthy, why? Yield your talents and abilities to helping others. God has given you so much to contribute to this world. Romans 12, 6, you can look later in 1 Peter 4, 10. He has given you so much, so you are a woman of worth. And I'll end with this story. Last summer, my husband and I, we took a trip to Virginia to, to visit our daughters. And we have four dogs, and we took two of our dogs with us because we just love them. And they're like our, our, our children because we don't have our children at home anymore. So we took them down, and he, they needed to do a, a pit stop, all of, all of us. And so my husband says, well, I go to the restroom. I want you, you know, just stay here with the dogs. So we tied the dogs to a tree, and, and I was watching the dogs, and I was sitting down on the grass with them. So my husband came out, and he is, he's, he's, I noticed that he didn't look at us, that we were by the tree, you know, looking at him. And, you know, the dog's attention was on him, and so was I. You know, I was like, hmm, where's he going? And so he turned around, and he was about to get in the car. And the dogs, I, have you seen the dogs when they give you that look like, huh? <laughs> well, all three of us, the dogs and myself, we were like, huh? What is he doing? He was about to get in the car and then he turned around and said, oh, I almost forgot. 
Now, I have a sense of humor, so of course the first thing I started doing was crack up because I thought it was hilarious. I said, well, you would have figured out we weren't with you about 10 miles on the road. <laughs> but you know what? God is not like that. He watches every move. He keeps his eye on you like, like he says, I'm watching you. But he says it with a much positive attitude. You see, ladies, don't be afraid to, to, to just be all that God has created you to be because he's watching over you and he's providing for each and every one of your needs so that you can be all that you can be. Okay? Amen? Amen. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful that you are El Roy, that you watch over us that you are the God, the mighty God who sees us. Nothing escapes your notice. You take knowledge of, of uh, you acknowledge our existence by providing for all of our needs. And we are so thankful for that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for forgiveness. And thank you, Lord, that each day you're helping us grow to be all that you have created us to be for such a time as this. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us each and every moment of our lives and let us be ready for your kingdom and help others to be ready as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.